Hey everybody, welcome back to Woodworking Wisdom. My name's Colin Way, and today is all about the German smoker. And I'm going to explain a little bit about the German smoker, because if I just say German smoker, some people won't know what I'm talking about. So I'm really pleased to be doing this demonstration as my last demonstration of the year, um, because it's one of the demos that I've been doing a lot of this year. And if you know me or if you've seen any of my demonstrations, especially around this time of year, you know that I'm all about Christmas. I love the season. However, my Christmas demonstrations, I want to be able to take beyond the festive period. So I've put them in different garments and I've made different characters that can relate to other things apart from Christmas. So I've turned the smokers into an all year round demonstration. Um, in fact, I shall be doing the same thing uh, in my first demo starting, uh, I think it's on the 8th of January and then a few in the March as well. So I've managed to drag Christmas outside of that period. Um, German smokers. And now the, the two that I've got here, the two that I've got in focus, Ben, can you go back to this camera again, just so I can, show everybody these we've got a, a couple of characters that i've demonstrated a lot and i feel like i've shown you guys this already the reason being i've done so many of these demos i've done some for chestnut the finishing company i've done some for several raw suppliers in other countries as well as well as private demos for clubs and things so that's why i feel that i've done a lot of these but look, we've got our Viking here, very classic uh, Viking or classic, I say a classic Viking shape. It's one that I've sort of come up with. Um, and we've got our wood turner. Of course, we need to do a wood turner. We're all wood turners. Our wood turner does include, where have I put it? Oh, yes, we even have a little Colwyn Way signature skew, which I will get to do for you. Hopefully, um, tomorrow that will be because we're going to do some of the, the painting and, and the refinements tomorrow, do a bulk of the turning today. I uh, made a little lay there just to just to go with it, a little uh, 406 to match what we'll be using here, an SK114 chuck, of course, a little walnut bowl. Um, our wood turner has a hat, and in fact, every, um, every character that I tend to make has some sort of hat because that's part of its identity um, in terms of the Viking, an obvious identity there, but whatever you make, if you're doing a policeman, um, if you're doing a farmer, if you're doing whatever character you, that, that, you, know, that you want to do, part of the identity is in what you put on them because if you look at the figures themselves they're actually made in the same way the base the legs the feet the body the the head the arms they're all done the same we've got a smock on everything here you don't have to you can um, make refinements and make longer arms that sort of thing if you want to but that's what i've gone with just to keep it a little bit simple and then it's how you dress them um that gives them the character itself the lovely thing with with smokers is their their purpose i suppose is they're a good luck charm and it's the a, a german inspiration like i said um and they're very closely linked with nutcrackers i did mention this when we were doing the nutcrackers that nutcrackers go up pre-christmas so in the in advent and then post-christmas the the smokers go up these represent your working man so general workers so things like wood turners obviously vikings but farmers um joiners brickies all those sorts of things um they're they're smokers where your nutcrackers are your authority figures so kings and queens and soldiers and guards and all that sort of stuff um so very different figures i do tend to give the um the smokers a little bit more earthy colors but really it's entirely up to you you can go primary you can really make them um, strong characters or even things like you know clowns where you can go all primary colors that sort of stuff um, and the good thing is because they're a good luck charm you they're designed to be given to people so you can create the character of the person that you're giving them to their profession for instance um, i know over the past couple of uh, of months i've managed to do a lot of different figures including nurses and and things like that as well which you know is proper fitting for the times that we're living in at the moment but the smoker so let me explain what i mean about smoker so it's an incense burner basically and if i just take this one if i just move our viking to one side incidentally the viking does have his own shield a little bit of chroma craft going on or chroma guilt um, going on here um, and a little bit of um, decorating elf just to decorate those Ooh. And if I bring Mr. Smoker over there, let's have a look at the wood turner as that's the best position. The smoking section. So if we lift the body off, it will come off. There's the smoking section. I'll tilt this towards you. So this little cup on top here, that's to hold your incense cone. You see a couple of holes in the base. That's a flue. And then what you do is light your cone. You put the body on top and then the smoke comes through 
the hole in its mouth. So if I can get the light just right and I can hold this up, you should see right the way through to the mouth. Okay, so the smoke comes up just like a chimney all the way through um, and puts that lovely smelling scented uh, incense into the room. So that's what's supposed to get rid of all the, all the nasty spirits and bad luck, I guess. So a lovely little thing to get out every single year or like I've done here, if you're not interested in, in making it Christmas orientated, um, you could turn it into a penguin or something like that, Maria. Um, and you can have it all through the year if you wanted to, whatever figure you make. You don't have to have a Father Christmas or something Christmas related. All right. So there we are. That's what our, our uh, plan is for today. We're going to go from the ground up, like every other figure that we do, work from the ground upwards. Um, I'll leave it to you guys to do most of the painting and decorating afterwards, making things like laves and all that stuff. That takes a little bit more work, of course, not necessarily wood turn apart from the bowl. Um, but, you know, dress your your smoker accordingly and i think we've got ben on the cameras today um, and asking questions you know how it works use the chat function ask us questions better relay them to to me and uh, i'll do my best to answer them for you so yes greg what's the first one um so jim's asking are we going to get to see it smoking today not today this is a two-parter jim so we're going to do first part today get both bulk of the turning done today and then tomorrow we'll finish it off do a little bit of airbrushing that sort of stuff now the only way i can get it smoking in here is if I um, cover up the smoke detectors because uh, of obvious reasons. But let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll work that one out. I'll see what I can do tomorrow. One other thing. Um, let me just get a lot of the talking done out of the way before we start turning. So I'll get my base over ready. Um, someone last week asked if there's going to be plans available. Now, I sell plans to make these on Etsy. Now, I can't just go and give you the plans now because everybody that's bought one are going to email me uh, with a complaint. Um, so they are available. My link for my Etsy page is below this. Also, my website as well for various bits of hardware. That The link, again, is, is below. But if you want the plans to make or the line drawings for the Nutcracker, um, if you go to last week's video, so making the Nutcracker, they are available, available on that uh, YouTube um, as a link below, again, as normal, like everything else. So you can get those plans there. Okay, but like if you want an actual color brochure on how to make the, the smokers, go to my Etsy page, download it there. You'll see a nice Father Christmas on the front cover, all that sort of stuff, um, and um, website for hardware. So let's get that out of the way to start with. Other thing that I will give you more details on in the new year, um, Mark Adams School of Woodworking and uh, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts have just released a couple of courses. They are early registrations. If you're looking to come on a course, I shall be doing two courses, one with Nick Agar for a fortnight at Aramont um, in July and another one toward the end of August into September at Mark Adams. So that's if you're in the States, maybe a chance that we get to meet each other. Come along, have a look at their websites first, come along to the courses and, uh, and we'll make some Christmas orientated gifts. That's all I'm going to say, but have a look yourselves. That's Mark Adams and Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Right, let's crack. Now I've done all my own advertising. Let's crack on and do some, do some turning. We're going to use a, a variety of chucks and centers in this one. Um, I've, I say whenever I do this demonstration, what I'm using here is not um, a blueprint for, for your shopping. You don't have to go buy everything I'm using, basically. You can just make your figure suit the jaws, chucks, centers that you have. So, it's, you know, you, you don't have to buy everything that I'm doing. What I am doing is using here to start with a set of A plus jaws. They're the right size for this particular piece. And this is going to be the base. So what I'm doing just for the minute is making this section. Now, this section is the body. It's basically the seat, what we call the, um, not the scene holder, the, the incense cone holder, which is going to be here. So you can see what we've got to make. We've got to make the base, the feet, the legs, and the little holder itself, where the body eventually sits on. It's all linked together with six mil dowel. You've seen me use that time and time again. Um, and most of what we're doing is pre-drilled. The only thing that I haven't pre-drilled um, today is the base. I've actually marked it, but whether those marks will be gone in a minute, I'm not sure. We'll look at how we can get that marked up in a minute um, once we've done the turning. So let's start off with the back. I'm going to pop that in the chuck. Um, a plus jaws, these are because of the, they just are the right size for this, this section. And what I want to do with this is just... Um, clean up that back face, and we're going to do a recess in this. So the underside is going to look like this. 
So we've got that nice little recess. And that recess is made for the O'Donnell jaws. The OD, in this case, the 112s, which are those. They're perfect. The My last batch of smokers were a batch of 22, I think it was. So where I'll be swapping over often for you today, just in this short one-hour slot, um, normally if I'm doing a batch, I'll do the whole section. I'll do 22 bases at this stage, turn them over 22. So I'm not changing um, things over often. Um, I can keep things in one place. It's just a bit bit more um, time saved, I guess. Yes, Ben, another question. Um, so Hodgepodge would like to know, have you yet recuperated from um, losing to Les and Martin in the <laughs> trivia quiz? Yes, I'm sure um, we're, we'll be working on a... Um, uh, our chance to to fight back soon. So uh, I think in not in the too too distant future we'll have a um, a round two. I'm sure because we thoroughly enjoyed that evening. Um, I can't remember too much about it by the end of it, but I thoroughly enjoyed that evening. Thank you, Hodgepodge, for reminding me. By the way, <laughs> and Norbert's asking, um, would you please rem- mention the book? Is it Erzberg? Erz- Erzberg. Erzberg. Um, uh, would you mention the book that you used as an inspiration? I'll get it in some, I'll bring it in tomorrow because I can't remember what it's because it's all in German. Um, and I can't remember what its name is. That's the region of Germany, Erzgebirge region of Germany, which translates into the All Mountains. Um, so if you look All Mountains, or another thing to look up in for inspiration is Seifen. The, so the town of Seifen, which I think is S E I double F E N. It's either that or S I E double F E N. It's one of it. Um, and Obenhau as well, another, that's a slightly bigger town, but Seifen is the epicenter, um, which is a small village really, um, and then Obenhau being uh, a, a bigger town. But it's all in that all-mountain band near the Czech-German um, border. Okay. But yeah, I'll, I'll bring it in tomorrow. I'll have to make a note of that. And Bob P saying he's already signed up to that Aramount class and he can't wait. Oh, fantastic. I'll be great to see you, Bob. Excellent. Right then, let's get started. We might be able to do a woodworking wisdom close by because that's going to run over a Tuesday. So I'm, I'm, we are planning to do a woodworking wisdom, hopefully, fingers crossed, and stream back to Axminster. Okay, so let's go for a quarter inch bowl gouge. And I'm just going to very lightly skim. Just taking away that uneven edge just whilst I can on this surface. Now it doesn't have to be dished at all because we're going to put a recess in there. So that doesn't really make a huge amount of difference. I'm going to just size my chuck now and just bring that in the camera. Uh, I just want to close that down to six mil gap. Um, shut that off while I'm doing that. I'm just going to shut the chuck to six mil gap. I'll, I'll show you. Um, six mil gap, roughly a pencil width apart. Um, that's where you're going to get your perfect circle. Then I'm going to eyeball my my diameters. You can measure, of course, measure with a rule, a bit more accurate, and then and then make your measurement. Or look in the Axminster catalog or the website, and that'll give you the optimum sizes. So there you go. You have that. Um, you'll have those sizes. I'm just going to mark center with a pencil, just because my old eyes can't see as good as they used to. And there we are. We'll put a little mark in. So that's going to be my size. We're going to go with a parting tool now next. I won't do too much sanding today either. I think, you know, you don't need me to show you the sand. I'll, I'll sand a couple of the key parts, some of the parts that I want to paint for you later. Um, but we won't worry too much today. And then, well, that was a parting tool, so that was about a three mil, so a quarter, um, a one-eighth inch depth is about right. You know, that'll be enough for this. We're not going to produce a huge amount of, um, of pressure on this piece and then i'm going to drag with the part with the bowl gouge away from that line because this corner here is my um important corner and that's where we're going to put a dovetail in a minute so i'm going to drag away from there i don't want to drag toward it otherwise i can potentially run into it there we are and then bevel rub There we go, bevel rub, and we're going to now use a skew just to give myself a nice little dovetail. Mm. 
And at that point, you would, you're going to sand. You can see this is fairly torn at the moment. So what you would need to do is sand that up um, and give it a good coat of sanding sealer. I say that. I say sanding sealer. Whatever you're doing, um, let me get this, this figure here for you. So if you're going to keep the timber as the star of the show, so here we've got some nice sapili down here as the base. We've got some olive wood which is beautiful timber up, up for the hat. Um, if you're keeping them stars of the show, I was still sanding seal because then I'd like to put an acrylic lacquer over the top, um, which shows the, the timber through really nicely and, uh, and doesn't discolor too much, doesn't darken too much. But if you look at the, um, the, the, the rest of the clothes, the trays are here, the shoes, um, and even the smock, they're with an opaque paint. So I've used a spray paint. I've used Cobra... Um, uh, graffiti art paints they're really good aerosol um, they're a single cover there's such such depth in their pigment that they work really really well but if you want to go transparent then you don't sanding seal transparent colors will basically mean wood dye or spirit stains now i use two i use the uh, chestnut spirit stains or the chromacraft wood dyes um, and i don't put a sanding sealer on first you put the color straight onto the timber and then you seal over the top of the color Okay, you may find you have to denib a little bit, but even then, what I tend to do is put the sanding uh, the the dye on, then a coat of um, of lacquer, and then denib, then put another coat of lacquer on. I find that works really really well. Um, but you can see the the difference between opaque colours, as in the um, the graffiti art paints, and this one is these are transparent, so you see the wood grain through. So for that reason, you need to go with a pale timber um, to make these figures, otherwise it will discolour the dye. So don't use a dark timber and then expect your yellows and oranges and things to stay the true yellow and orange because it won't happen. So these, I'm using sycamore, maple, or lime. They're the best timbers for it. They're pale. Holly, things like that, they're all going to work. Okay, but when it comes to the opaque colours, it doesn't matter. You can use whatever timber you want. Yes, Ben? So Jim B's asking, um, do you speak German and could you give us a demo? <laughs> <laughs> Nine. <laughs> That's the only thing. Um, and two beers seems to translate all over the world. So, uh, no, sorry, Jim. I don't, I don't, I, for my sins, I don't speak many other languages, unfortunately. And I wish, I really do wish I do. I wish I did. Um, I'd like to speak French, Spanish, German. They're my top three at the moment. I've had no excuses either apart from turning all the time. So there we are, OD112s. Checking to make sure nothing's touching the tool rest. I'm going to clean up that edge first. Lathe speed is zero, turn the lathe on. There we are. I'm going to drop the handle down and skim the edge. That means I'm presenting the bowl gouge almost like a skew. You can see those ribbon shavings that are coming off. That's going to give us a beautiful finish. That means we're not going to have to work too hard with abrasive to clean that up. Now, the next thing, I want to clean that face up. That face has to be nice and flat. Otherwise, your legs on your smoker are going to sort of jut out at a weird angle. So let's just skim, skim the surface. And then with your large skew chisel... Just use the flat of the skew. This is going to really help keep it all nice and flat. It's just a bit of side grain, so it's not going to cause you issues. Just a nice gentle cut. Don't try and don't try and cut a, a big um, cut with a skew chisel as a scraper because it will rip quite badly. So the idea is that it literally is scraping like a cabinet scraper. So it gives you a really fine finish. So with that, you shouldn't have too much to sand. I'm not going to sand for you, not on this bit. You don't, I don't need to here. Um, and you certainly don't want to watch me sand all these pieces. So there we are. That's our base. So I would do, if you're doing a couple of um, smokers, I would just finish. I would do all the bases first before you move on um, to the next job. Now, luckily, well, not luckily, I have my two marks there for center. And 
I got those marks by using a template. Template is really important. Templates are really important for a lot of things. So I've just used a card one here, a bit of old um, cereal packet. Um, that's my mark. Don't worry that it's not exactly the same size because you can pretty much judge where it's got to go. But it's important that these two holes are in line with the holes that are going to go into my um, my top section. Otherwise, the, the legs are going to be at an angle. So um, that's what I use. Just brad or mark in each one, and then we're free. Now, normally, and like I've said, I've pre-drilled everything. The reason I've pre-drilled everything is quite simple. What I want is those holes to be the right depth and in the right place. So if we take, for instance, the next few bits I'm going to be using, um, I've got a foot there and I've got a leg there. I want them to be upright and I want them to be um, at the right depth. Freehand drilling, you can't drill at the right depth. You can put tape on things, but then it's still a little bit of guesswork. This is the only bit I'm going to freehand drill because I don't want to take this away now um, and uh, go to the pillar drill. I don't want to bring a pillar drill in here, that sort of thing. But normally, I would always do this with a pillar drill. Set the depth so I don't go right the way through the thing. I'm going to be very genteel with what I'm about to do, um, and that's drill with my hand drill with a 6 mil lip and spur bit. Okay, lip and spur bit is important because I don't want any drift, and I want a clean hole um, once I've finished. So before we do this drill, uh, these two little holes, let me just take a couple more questions and have a slurp of tea. So <clears throat> David saying, hello, Mark. Sorry, David saying, hello, Colin. Um, a question about finishing. He'd like to sometimes he likes to sometimes use Yorkshire grit. Um, can he use a dye friction polish after? Um, he knows that an oil finish is okay. Um, I wouldn't. I've never tried it. I wouldn't have thought so. Only because Yorkshire grit is a wax based finish. That's why you can use oil. Um, where the uh, Dye needs to penetrate, so I wouldn't have thought so. I would, but to be fair, as long as you've got rid of all the scratches, so a six hundred grit or even a rotary sander, then you can put your your dye straight onto that. So um, I get where you're coming from. I don't think that would work, but uh, it'd be worth trying if you put a bit of scrap timber on and just just try it and see what happens, and then share it with the rest of us. Let us all know as well. All right. Yeah, all right for a minute. So, yeah, I'm just going to do this. The the other reason that I don't like doing this by hand is it's not as safe as as it could be. You know, you're you're literally holding something with a hand, and you've got a sharp drill bit rotating in your other hand. Um, I'm going to be extremely careful, um, and only drill down about a quarter of an inch. Or that's not deep enough. Being too careful there. Oh, I will live with that. Um, because I'm ever so nervous about going through. But if we go through at this point, we'll have to start again. There we go. That's it. So that's the last bit of hand drilling I'm going to be doing. Everything else would get done on the pillar drill normally. But there we are. That's the start. So now we need to make some feet. So we need to start working up through the through the model. I'm going to come back to that, and you must excuse me. Um, I've got a suffering a little bit of man flu at the moment, so any of the guys out there will understand exactly how severe that can be. So excuse me, sniffing and snorting around. I don't mean it. That'll generate a topic of conversation there, won't it? Um, okay, so that's the base. Let's look at the feet. For the feet, we're going to put our, or load up our sanding disc. Again, this year we've used nothing but this sanding disc. So C jaws are going on. And we load up the disc itself. I've put links to this below the video as well, so you can see all the parts that we use to make this sanding disc up and the sanding table as well. Now, I know when someone's been playing with my sanding table because the height's not right. <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> There's a little collar down here, everybody. So the collar is a stop collar for the height, and you set that for the height of your lathe. All right, so I'm going to go about there for the minute. Lathe speed to zero. 
before we turn the lathe on. And the feet blanks, again, they're templated out. So what I've got, two little blanks there. I've pre-drilled these again, just because it saves me going to the drill afterwards. Um, and these are made, I cut a lot of these at a time. So a strip of timber, thickness and plain, so they're all the same size, and then chop them up into their individual pieces. So we've got lots of little blanks like that. Then I'll pop the template over, and then we'll just mark around that, scribe around that with a pencil. Get my fat fingers out of the way in a minute for you. Do whatever shape you want. This is just my interpretation. There we are. And then we're going to sand those. So we have a little bit of sanding, but I'm going to have dust extraction running for this. And we're going to sand the shape. Play speed to zero, turn the lathe on. This little system just transforms your lathe. You get another, basically another machine in the way of a disc sander. There we are. Now look, what that's done is just left a very fibrous back. As it's done its job so well. So we're just going to very gently, you come toward the center of the disc, and just sand around the edge, just deeper. There we are. Now, that's okay. They're quite blocky, so we're going to make a, a little um, chamfer on the, the very end to represent the toes. A bit more on that one. There we are. So those are the those are the feet. Very quick, very simple. A little bit of hand sanding on these now. Um, and I would go to a rotary sander uh, pad. So there we are. For instance, I would use one of those now because we can go down through the grades on those all the way to sort of 400 grit and really give them a nice finish um, before painting those. You know, feet, generally the feet are going to be a different color from the rest, um, you know, the rest of the figure. Um, not all the time, of course, but but most of the time. So um, with it, everything we do now is literally going to be just a, um, there's no glue involved. We're just going to very gently start putting things together. So we can dismantle. And for that reason, I'm using fluted um, six mil dowel because it comes apart easier. Yes, Ben, far away. So we've had a few questions come in. Um, first one's from Jim to me. He's asking me, why would I want to move the stop collar? <laughs> Colin's probably asking himself the same question. <laughs> it's because yesterday I um, I was preparing some pens and I brought in the craft lathe, which has a different um, center height. Um, so I was using his uh, sanding table to to um, trim my pens. Um, so I changed the the, the the height of the stop collar and to hodgepodge it wasn't just to annoy Carl with. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Grinch has been in whilst I've been away. <laughs> and um, hodgepodge is also asking, is there a reason why you use this method um, rather than the split turning way you used on the nutcrackers? Um, for the feet, um, I yeah, the nutcrackers, the, those rounded feet were more traditional for, for nutcrackers, where the, the smokers, they're a smaller figure. Um, and I've, I've never seen them split turned on a, on a smoker. Um, and I just like that sort of, it's more of a, oh, I don't even know what the word is, word is more of a folky sort of look than, 
um, than that really massive Christmassy look of a nutcracker. It, it, the rounded corners, corners on the nutcracker look better, um, I found. Um, that's the only reason, really. Um, and, I mean, it's 10 times easier to do what we've just done there as opposed to the split turning on the nutcracker. But they're not so big and, as, and elaborate either. Um, but, you know, you're right. You could do either for, for either, actually, um, if you wanted to do that style for the nutcrackers equally as, as easy to do. So there we are. We're going to come back to this one in a minute. We've got a lot of sanding to do on a smoker. So we'll come back to that one for the minute. Before I, you know, I was just about to say, before I take that chuck off, make sure I don't need it, but I don't. We're going to go back to between centers, and we're going to get uh, the best tool in the rack out, obviously a skew. And I think we know which skew is going to come out. So we're going to go for a couple of single-pointed centers for between centers. So that will be an, a regular single pointed tailstock center and we're going with a light pull drive in this end and we've got two pieces of timber now because we're going to turn the legs so there we are there are bits of prepped timber the, the hole isn't running all the way through it's just drilled on both sides and you can use your pen press or sorry your pen vice to do that um, or a regular drill vice but it is important that they are upright uh, again for same reasons otherwise you know your legs are going to be at funny angles and it's not going to they're not going to join nicely okay so it's going to be friction that we're driving these through. Six mil drill bit, like I said. And it just happens that one of the diameters on our uh, light pull drive is six mil. Lathe speed to zero, turn the lathe on, then whack that speed up. I want to be turning it around about 2,000 to 2,500. We're going to do the push-pull technique with the skew. Lay speed is currently 2.2, two, so a little bit higher, 2.3, 2,300. Two We're going to push forward and then drag back. And then forward, back, forward, back. There we are. Now, you can stay simple. You can stay simple in shape. You can see there is a very, very basic shape. Literally, all we've done is to put a slight taper on. I thought we'd do something a little bit different today. You could do these in two parts. I've got one that I've, one of my German ones I've got at home. They have a two-part leg, and that is a little, sort of like a sock, I guess is the best way to describe it. I'm just trimming the ends, by the way, just cleaning up. Once you've cleaned up, then just tighten the tailstock. So what I mean by the a sock is, is a chance just to just do a little roll, taper down, and then your thigh can come down to meet that diameter. Now, two part really, if you you're sensible about this, two part because you can then paint that black or whatever color and then glue that onto it, and that line will be absolutely distinct and precise. What I would do here, though, sand it, seal it, and paint it on the lathe, take it off, let it dry. Use a paint stick. We've spoken about paint sticks before, so another bit of sacrificial dowel. Put that in the hole, stand it up somewhere to dry uh, once you've painted it. So that would be a, a nice little way of doing that. I won't sand it. We'll, we'll just carry on now, and I'll do number two. There we are. So we need to repeat that process to another one of those. So I'll keep that next to me. So we're rough down, push pull. Think about where the, these legs are going to be positioned. They're right next to each other. So they have to be very similar. Notice I said similar.
Uh, and then we're going to taper. I'll come back and just double check diameters and everything in a moment. I'm not as worried with this sort of thing, this sort of project. I'm not as worried about, you know, how close we are as if I would be, say, like a piece of furniture, um, a staircase spindle, that sort of thing. Because this is literally just a decoration and you'll find you'll get away with a lot more than if you're looking up a staircase, seeing spindles and seeing a, a slight fluctuation in, in sizes. That's not too bad at all. A little bit off diameter. Here we are. And I think we can live with that. Let's sand it up. All right, so that can come off. Just, just move the skew for the minute. We're going to get lots of chance to use skew chisels. Think about the part of Germany this come from. It's the traditional tool would be the skew, and these type of splay skews that I'm deciding to go with. So there we are. Let's. What's in shot? There, let's come back here. Yes, Ben. Whilst I'm putting this together, what, what have you got for me? <coughs> Nigel would like to know the best place to buy uh, a Conrad spray paint, or did you say Cobra? Cobra, yeah, Cobra spray paint. Um, I use the online um, uh, Amazon online. Uh, if you put Cobra spray spray paint, no, Cobra with a K, so K O B R A, and it's um, it's designed for graffiti art. Um, hence the the heavy pigment. There we are. So you can see sort of like a, you can see what we've got, like a little boot or sock or whatever you want it to be. It just gives you that nice little rolled, rolled effect. Um, it's different from the ones I've got finished there. Um, but now what we have to do is create, we've done the legs. Okay, we've got to create this platform that our um, incense holder would sit on. And you can't just put an incense cone on there because as soon as it burns down to the timber, it starts burning the timber and potentially be a fire hazard. So we're going to have a metal um, metal or glass uh, barrier there. All right, so that's what we're going to do next. Now, if you look on this one, I've got a center point, and this particular one has a ring center. If I use the single pointed center on this one, it'll sink in too far, especially with the material that I'm using here, which is cedar. Um, so I'm going to use a ring center again. I've got another piece of cedar here. This is a bit of Western red. Okay, um, I do have a center point. Now I've got four holes in this one. This is a finished, or a finished drilling on this one. These two are the accurate ones. These aren't. <laughs> I've just bunged these in where I thought they, they looked right. Um, but these are the flue holes. These are the vents that allow the, the, the air to circulate. And these are my joining holes. So these will be the same distance apart as the, the leg centers are. So what I'll do now, we're going to go back on with a chuck, but we're still going to turn between centers, if that makes any sense at all. So let's get rid of our friction drive just for the moment i'm going to go back in with my what am i going to use with those that's it i'm going to go back in with my 112s od 112s then we're going to use a push plate again i've used push plates numerous times on different projects different size push plates this is obviously a little tiny dinky one if you compare that to one of the bowl push plates that we've used um, before you know, you compare the sizes. This is for reversing a bowl and taking the foot away. This one's for turning these little pieces in between centers. Both use router matting. Um, so router matting being a non-slip material really, really helps with this. This is a lovely way of working. Great for production turners. It just means that you can load pieces in between centers without damaging them. If we change our center to that ring center... There we go. And you can do as many of these as you want to without really changing this, this around. So look, I've got my center point there. All we're going to do is offer that up to that pad with the center point engaged. Lock him in position, a little bit of friction, and then we can turn. And because I've planed this, both surfaces already, um, they're not going to need any any um, any turning. So they're going to be a little bit of sanding involved in those in a moment on the disc sander, but that's it. 
Um, so first of all, I need to just make this into a round. So lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on. Before I start, Ben's got another question. Sorry, a question from me, Ian. Are all the blank dimensions um, available in your book on Etsy? Yes, they are. Yeah, they're all, we've measured them all out. They are in metric, um, so it'd be in millimeters, but yes, they are. And Nigel would like to know, well, he's, he's saying he's made a couple of uh, smokers, and although they smoke okay, they don't smoke for long. Um, is the quality of the incense cone important? Um, it is. Um, but what I found is you've got to get them really hot because I've had the same issue. You've got to get them really hot before they stay burning. So what I like to do is light the incense cone and just leave it with the top off probably for about a minute, a minute and a half before putting it on. The vent holes, I've increased the size of those as well to eight mil, so two eight mil holes to get that airflow. Um, and a seven mil hole for the mouth. Um, that's really, really important. So you're getting lots of airflow, um, and that should keep the vent, keep the thing alight, and keep a, a nice amount of airflow going. All right, definitely. One thing I'll also, um, we've turned together um, uh, the carousels, Christmas carousels, Christmas pyramids, and I'm getting a few people saying, oh, I can't get them to turn. So there are two reasons for that. Um, friction will be the main one. That needle has to be an absolute point um the second um, reason will be to the distance from the impellers um to the, the the candles third one sorry um will be too much weight in the impellers and the scene um and the fourth one um, which is out your control a lot of the time will be the temperature within the house if you've got a very hot house you're not getting a lot of energy from the candles if you've got a cold house it's going to go around really really quickly and easily so there we are just wanted to say that yes ben so this is probably one for the Axminster team, but do you know off the top of your head, Cole, and if we do a 80 mil, the SK80 with the T38 thread? The... I, I, no, we don't. No, it's just two sizes, uh, inch, uh, inch by eight and three quarter 16. Nice and quick with the speed. Oh, this is end grain we're turning now. So, so I'm running 1800 revs there and I'm going to drop my handle right the way down, just skim towards center. Come back the other way, do the same thing. There we are, that's fine. And then that will need just a little bit of sanding. I'm not going to do too much because Ben is massively allergic to cedar, so I don't want to I don't want to start him off. There we are. We'll leave that. That's a really nice finish, actually, because we dropped that handle down. We were using the gouge as a skew, almost using the bottom edge. And it gives you a lovely finish on end grain. Um, you know, cedar is notoriously difficult to finish on end grain at the best of time. So that as good a finish as possible there now is good. And because of I'm not wanting to get much... Um, dust in the air let's just use the flat disc take deeper give it that final sand and we're done that's a ready finished piece so we'll get that onto our base so far there we are let me cut if you need to cut a little bit of dowel i haven't got my my regular that won't be any good to use that. I haven't got my regular um, V block. I like to cut on a V block most of the time. Uh, how long are we going to go an inch? Oh, I'll tell you what, we have some pre cut ones in here. I'd like to go a little bit longer, if I'm honest with you, but these will make do for the demonstration. Just tap them through. Remember, everything we're doing will need to be dismantled anyway for painting. There we are. That is our finished base so far, minus colour. All right. Very quick. I'm 
you've heard me say this before, but I tend to do anything that I make in batches, unless it's you know a bowl, a dextrin bowl, that sort of stuff. But everything in batches, and it just screams out production. That one, even if even if you're a beginner, do a couple. You know, great presents for those people that have everything, as they say. Um, we're going to work on to a nice big piece next, so I need to remove the chuck. We're going to tackle the body. So we're going to do a little bit of between centre turning to get the body primed, ready for the chuck. So there we are. This is a piece of sycamore again. And we just need to centre up. This is a little technique on centering that I've used right the way from my apprenticeship. Basically a marking gauge because marking gauge just gives you that little cross in the middle. All right, just by going around all four edges, look. Doesn't matter if your piece of timber isn't square, you'll still find center. And it doesn't matter if your corners are missing, if you've, you know, if you knock your corners off to do a, um, a production run, you still find center with that technique. Yes, Ben, question. Um, so Maria's asking, where do you get the incense cone holders? Um, well, I import them from Germany. I get them in bags of 100 at a time. Um, if you're wanting any, Maria, go on to my website and uh, go into the hardware page um, on the shop and um, you'll see them there, incense cone holders. And Fred said he's put one of it, one of his club members has put a, a microwave turntable motor in a pyramid. Excellent. And he says it's very effective. <laughs> I can imagine it would be. You, know, you could go several tiers with a microwave motor um, whizzing it around. Right speed as well, I would have thought. It's fantastic. There we are. So we're going to knock the corners off. And I just want to prep again to hold in the OD112s. So I'm going to use a set of calipers this time. And I'm going to measure the internal diameter. So you may not see that. Oh, oh, that's not too bad. You can see there. So I'm just going to measure the internal diameter of my jaw. It's a little bit wider than i want it to be so let's just creep it down a little bit there we are and we're going to do a nice little dovetail step i guess first though we need to knock the corners off so make sure nothing's going to touch make sure you've got everything running nicely lay speed to zero turn the lathe on and then up the speed about 1600 revs to 1800 will be fine start off with a roughing gouge There we are. Um, then I'm going to go with my parting tool, beading and parting tool, so square section chisel. And then use the calipers, and we're going to size that little foot. Here we are. So we've got the outer diameter right now. All I need to do now is create the dovetail. Let's go with a skew. Tidy up that underside. A little bit wider than I actually want it to be, but that's fine. We'll live with that. All right, so we're, we're quite wide at the moment. I think that's going to be far too wide for what we want. But I'm also I just aware that I just need to check that because that is going to have to fit inside. So actually, I'm not far off. I can't go too much smaller. Okay, so we will keep it there so I can start shaping now. Yes, Ben? So Mark's, Mark's got a question about um, the wall thickness of the body. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to be, be around about 
at its very thickest area, about three eighths of a of a of an inch, so about ten mil. Um, but you anything really between eight and ten works. What you've got to be able to do, um, certainly on the top of your smoker, is that hole. It doesn't really want to travel far. And I'm looking down there at the moment. That's about eight mil I've got inside there. I don't know whether you can make that out. About eight millimeters before it hits the head. You know, it's got to travel all the way up through that head as well. So um, about eight, about eight to ten mil maximum um, thickness. So it's just like um, box turning, really. And then Martin's asking about spalted plum wood. Is there anything to to look out for? Is it food safe? He's used it in a couple of pepper grinders. Okay, um, spalting. Uh, people tend to turn their nose up at anything spalting for food, and to me, unless it's going to get wet, I can't see any issues at all. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't. I don't see any issues. For, certainly for a pepper mill, I can't see a problem with it. If I'm if I'm honest, um, spalting if it's dormant, if it's dry, no problems at all. all right. That's how I've always looked at it, anyway. So just up in the speed a little bit now. Um, we're going to go with a three eight bowl gouge. Get the rough shape. There we are. That's that's enough work with that one. Let's go with a skew now. Tall rest up. Um, if any of you were wondering, by the way, my our uh, we're just putting together January's schedule. One of my my things, what I like to do in January, understanding that people get new kit, um, is start looking at some basics again. And I know that a few of you have been asking for some spindle turning basics or, or some some advice. So you know skew chisels spindle gouges all those sorts of things so my first session back um is going to be all about the spindle turning um and we're going to do a huge amount of skew work in that as well um hopefully santa's kind to everybody and we'll bring you your new laves your new conway signature skews there we are round him over and i want to get a really really nice finish you think about the end grain here. It's important that the finish is good. Otherwise, you'll have a... When you start sanding, you'll see a, a difference. Sorry, when you start painting, you'll see a difference. Now, I've got to be careful how much to come on over here. We've already dis discovered that actually the, um, the holder for the incense cone isn't that much smaller than the body um, slice the end grain so i get a really good finish i only need to do the first 10 mil because the rest of the body is going to be taken out now so there we are that would now be sanded again let's, we will sand that actually because i want to do some um airbrushing for you uh, tomorrow so let's sand that one up very quickly. And then we'll hollow it out. We can do that before we finish today. I don't know whether you can see the finish already. We've got a really nice finish there. You can see the timber shining, um, but it still needs to have a good going over. So I'm gonna start with a 150. There we are. Now we can go down to our 240 and then 400 and a 600. And what you'll probably have to do, especially with sycamore, well, sycamore and maple actually, um, is use a rotary sander as well. But they, you will find yourself chasing scratches in these timbers. Um, and especially that transition between side and end grain up here. And it's ever so visible, unless you're doing an opaque color, if you're doing a transparent color, you will see any slight difference. So it's important that it's absolutely on point. You just get my two finer abrasive, so 400 and a 600.
Now, let's have a look and see if we can see any scratches. Well, I can't, but I don't trust that. I don't trust what I can see, as I know from experience, the minute you put a little bit of a little bit of stuff on it, as in dye, that probably some will pop out. So I'll just give it a very quick blast with the rotary sander. It doesn't have to be a power sander like that. You can use, you can use your your normal hand rotary sander. The only reason I use the power sander is because my rotary one's gone missing. I've put it down somewhere. Oh, I can see it. I put it on the table over there. Um, but it doesn't matter. There we are. So again, if you're doing several of them, you can get them all to that stage before you move on dismount everything off the lathe, put a chuck on and, and so on. So now what we've got to do is hold that section. We're going to take out the center now and create that foot. Make sure the join is right for our um, incense holder. And let's remove the center. Um, and we are now going for our 112s, our OD 112s. Now, I'm going to use the tailstock in a moment. We're going to do part of this just by drilling. Um, make sure everything is nice. Yeah, that's good. Nice and firm. I don't want to take, uh, you know, give this too much pressure. We're going to go with a fairly lumpy drill bit. This particular one, it doesn't matter, you know, you don't have to be overly precise. This is a 40 mil um a wave bit but it doesn't have to be 40 mil it could be 35 you know it could be an inch if you wanted to 25 mil yes ben um so robert's asking you about the angle to sharpen your skews your your coal and waste skew. um the, the angle on the skews when they come they're supposed to be 25 degrees single side so single uh, 25 degrees single size, so 50 degrees overall. However, it doesn't matter massively. The, what, what I would say, the more you bring the angle this way, the um, the friendlier they become, but the less of a you get don't get as clean a cut. The more knife-like you present it or uh, grind it, you get a much better cut, but it becomes quite aggressive. So 25 degrees for me single side um, is a good halfway house. Um, like I can say if you go toward more toward 15, then you're going to start getting a bit of a twitchy chisel, um, and more toward 30, 35, then it's an effect blunter, um, but it's friendlier as well. So play with those angles, but about 25 is like I say, it's halfway house. It, it seems to work nicely. There we are. Right then, make sure I'm centered. Pretty good. Lay speed to zero. Turn the lathe on. I know where I'm cutting to. I'm not guessing this. I've already measured this before we went on. And um, I'm actually going to be cutting up to that point there. So four mil away from where the silver bit ends. Um, we might get a little bit of smoke. I'll put the dust extraction on. One hand on the chuck all the time. Away from the drill bit, but on the chuck. I'm running. I want to be running about 900 revs. Take that away just turn that off for five seconds take my drill chuck out of the way and now we can start thinking about hollowing that's taken a lot of the work away from me especially that center pith 
which sometimes can be quite troublesome when hollowing into end grain. So that's gone. I'm going to take the tail stock off. Yes, Ben, another question? So a question from Frederick. Um, do you use different angles on your skews for hard and softwood? No. No. Um, I know where you're coming from, though. Um, in theory, um, a finer angle, say 15 degrees, should be better for hardwoods. Um, but no, I don't. I tend to stick with what I've what I'm given. What I mean by that is I I use um, chisels here. So I've got a bank of chisels here. I've got a bank of chisels at home. I might be going to a, a somewhere else where I have to use their chisels. What you know, a skewed chisel essentially is you've got a rubber bevel on a on the timber and raise the handle to get the the cutting edge engaged. It doesn't matter what the bevel angle is, that happens regardless of the angle. So you raise the handle, you get a cut. You drop the handle, you, the, the handle, you get less of a cut. Um, your height differs, the lathe height differs, so that's going to present you at the lathe at a different position as well. So there, there is a lot of talk about angles, and I get it on, on woodworking chisels and planes, things like that. But when it comes to a mechanical-powered machine, um, then I don't think it makes a huge difference, apart from what I just said um, in the previous question about being sharper edges, that sort of stuff, and present and producing a different finish. Um, so no, I, I don't mess around with them. I'll have what I'm given. And that in includes this angle here. Okay, so whether I'm, you know, whether it's flat on the top, whether it's a really pointed skew chisel, it doesn't matter because you just vary the handle to suit um you know suit the the grind that's on there so i don't know i get what i'm given i use what i'm given and robert would like to know what speed are you running your sanding disc at sanding disc is about a thousand revs at maximum down to about 800 um if i'm a bit twitchy and um it's a big disc for instance so i've got a couple of 300 mil discs so i'll run at about 800 revs and maria's asking um would you recommend 25 degrees for a bog standard skew Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no problem at all. Obviously, the thicker they get in terms of if you're using, um, say, for instance, you're using one of the new um, uh, Richard Finley's um, uh, beading and parting tools, um, then stick with what he recommends on that. I don't really have any experience on that, but I think that would be, I think that's a little bit more, but I'm not entirely sure. But the round skews, um, then you know 25 degrees is going to be spot on for those it'll give you quite a long um, bevel but that doesn't matter it really doesn't matter uh, if you're struggling don't you know if you've got a skew that's got a very um uh, knife like bevel say 15 degrees just put a secondary bevel on it to calm it down a little bit i wouldn't regrind especially and remember we don't sh we don't sharpen on a power grinder all the time most of the time you're sharpening with a um, a diamond file, that sort of thing, just to prolong the life. And it's unnecessary to sharpen on a power grinder every time on a skew. Okay, so don't don't worry too much about that. Right, I want to finish. I know we're running over, but I do want to finish the hollowing of this piece before we go over. Puts us in a good place for tomorrow then. So I'm going to start off with the small quarter inch or six mil bowl gout. Just going to do a few side cuts. And stop. Don't forget, we've got to create a nice position for our base to go in. So a little bit more off of there. I'm going to do that first before I finish the hollowing. Okay. Now I've done that, I'm going to use the skew again. And we're just going to size for the base. And what we don't want, we don't want a box lid fit. If we have a box lid fit where it goes on, you know, with pressure, um, what you'll end up doing is when you light your incense cone, you'll end up knocking it over when you put the top on because you're having to force it on. This needs to fall over the top, but then be stable once it's there. And that, most of the job of making it stable is the platform that we leave behind. So there we are. We're almost at a box fit now. That's going to be too tight. 
So we need to open that up probably by about half a mil. There, that's it. That's it, but I'm not deep enough. I still got about, I don't know, about two mil exposed at the moment. So we need to go drop them in a little bit further. But in terms of diameter, perfect. There we are. I'm happy with that. You can see now that's fully, um, you know, fully dropped in. Now we can start doing the main hollowing. So we go down a little bit with the quarter inch and then we'll go over to the three eight gouge. Wrong one. So side cut first. We're starting to get to that point now where we're getting like resonance and the vibration through the tool, and that's only because I'm going in quite deep with a fairly small chisel. So we'll go over to the three eighths and do the last few bits. And I'm going to start doing a conventional cut now. So a push cut. Well, there's nothing stopping you if you're into box making, is using your box turning tools, so the scrapers, box scrapers and things like that. But one thing I will also say, if we can just come round to the main camera, Ben, is if you've got a lathe like I've got here, so I'm already starting to feel my back hurt and I've only literally 30 seconds leaning over the lathe, but it's enough to, to hurt the back. So with this more sort of machine, and most machines now, you can just swivel, you know, swivel that round. So you're standing in front of where you're working and if you're bowl turning for long periods, this is really, really important to either be able to do that or bring the headstock up here so you can work this part of the lathe. Um, but that will save me so much and of course, if you're working up here, then you just bring that up with you. You know, it's, it's an easy, an easy way out, really. Now, that's too thick. At the moment, way too thick. So let's take a little bit more of that away. Just a quick check. Make sure you turn your lathe off. Don't be tempted just to shove your fingers in there with the lathe rotating. You're always going to get caught out. I think maybe one more cut and that'll see us see us done there. There we are. I think that's it. So just do a little visual with the with the double sided calipers, just so I can show you. Where do we get this in shot actually? There we are. So around about that ten mil, I can't see. But yeah, I'm around. It's a little bit wider at the bottom, but about ten mil is where I want to be. Grand. So let's take that off. Now, I'm going to really push my luck, and I'm going to do one more bit for you. So, look, we've got the OD112s in there. 
All I'm going to do now, let's say we finish the inside. We've sanded it and everything. We're going to put that over the top and we're going to expand into it. You don't have to use a one one twos. You could use any jaw. Most will expand this amount at least. Now, remember what we say about the expansion. This is a small amount of material that I'm gripping here. You want to do enough or give it enough pressure that you're going to grip but not split. So stop just before you hear the first crack. Spindle gouge next. Lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on. Spindle gouge um, because if we were using a bowl gouge, the bowl gouge could rake the end grain away. The skew chisel could possibly allow that timber to run up it, okay, and pop it out the chuck. A spindle gouge is a perfect combination of the two, and it gives us a really nice, friendly cut. It's much flatter than the bowl gouge, okay, and it's obviously got a curve on it, so it's not got that, um, that knife edge, but it gives a wonderful finish. Keep the bevel rubbing. Just a little dough. Be careful not to shear away that little pip in the middle. If you get to that sort of size, I back off a little bit and then just take lots of little progressive cuts just to get rid of it. And then we'll sand this. Now, I'll sand this whilst you're away um, and have it ready for you for tomorrow. But what I would do here, and I'd probably start with about 100 grit, go through to 150, 240, 400, but then power sand this, again, for the same reasons. I want to get rid of any of those little micro scr scratches, which are a thing when you come to working with sycamore. So just to make sure. And we'll get that ready. So we, so I want to give it some color for you tomorrow. We're going to do a little bit of air spraying as well. I'll bring in one of the Cobra paints just to give, get that on camera for you so you can see that also. But there, I hope you've enjoyed that, guys. Any questions, Ben, before we sign off for the day? Um, so Hodgepodge is asking, um, do you get a good finish doing a push cut into end grain, or is this just a hog out material and then you'll do a finishing cut? So, yeah, what you can do, you know, I don't know whether you saw right at the end there, I, I've done the main cut and then I backed off and gave another nice little finishing cut. Really important, especially on Sycamore as well. Um, if you take your main cuts, they will tear up quite badly. So either a box scrape or scrape or back off and do a tiny little wisp of a cut um, and just turn the gouge so you get a knife edge opposed to the raking cut you can, you know, you get from a bowl gouge normally. Just turn them up a little bit more so you get presenting more of that skew angle again. Um, but no, you're dead right because that needs to be quite clean. The inside of these have to be clean. A lot of the time you're taking that off and people that own these are going to look at the inside. So you've got to get a fairly good finish in there. You can't have it all raked out. Good point. All right, lovely. Right, well, there's a start, guys. All right, so tomorrow, what have we got left? We're gonna, we got a huge amount of sanding to do tomorrow because we're gonna sand flats. All of these joints are gonna be butt jointed together. So we're gonna make the arms, we're gonna make the hands, the head, um, and we're gonna do a hat of some sort, whether that's a Viking helmet, whether it's a regular hat. We'll, uh, we'll discuss that tomorrow and take a vote. Um, and then I want to do a little bit of painting or we'll talk about painting. So airbrushing um, and um, aerosol as well. So I hope you like that. If you liked everything that we've done, don't forget what I always say. Um, thumbs up if you can. Subscribe if you haven't. And share with your friends if you, if you can as well. So thanks very much, guys. Um, join me back here um, tomorrow for what is going to be the last one of the year so far. Um, back to part two of our German smokers. Thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.